Welcome back to this conversation around the India growth story and the opportunities it presents to Indian investors. And of course, with me is Manish Dangi, CIO Fixed Income at Aditya Birla Sun Life AMC to share his insights on the topic. So let's uh, get right to it. What are the emerging opportunities you actually see in sectors or industries? You know, is it green tech, infra, ed tech, agriculture? There's a whole host of sectors which are emerging, um, which would be, you, you could call them the new sunrise sectors. So which are these areas which you would like to focus on and which areas do you think will lag in this decade? So, okay, as I said in the beginning, Gautam, that, you know, India is so undercapacitated. Hmm. Anything that you think of, okay, from holy ke color to sofa set to anything, you know, there is opportunity almost everywhere, you know. But so since you asked me this question, you know, let me list the way from a macro framework standpoint, I think, you know, India is likely to witness a massive growth in something like home building or other construction businesses, okay. That is, in my view, at this stage of development, you know, mm. is pivotal to us achieving a reasonable growth. By the way, understand this, that, you know, we are not a frontier economy, right? I mean, I don't expect Indian enterprises to build uh, what do you call hydrogen cells and, 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 you know, not make major strides in AI and machine learning and sorts. Okay. Hmm. Nor do I expect, I mean, it's a great news that our pharma guys have been able to sort of come up with, you know, a vaccine, but then, you know, I don't expect that, let's say for HIV or hepatitis, you know, our pharmaceutical firms will invest and, and, you know, have mm. patents mm. Uh, those uh, you know go up against the Pfizer's of the world yes so I, I don't expect we are a relatively uh, low to middle income economy and you know we must sort of ensure that capital which is extremely scarce okay and capital is not about money okay it's a risk capital that should be deployed in areas where you know we have low hanging fruits you know because if you put a lot of capital in frontier economy Gautam then you will get only 2% growth mm-hmm but we can easily achieve as China has been able to demonstrate that 8-9% growth, 7-8% growth. Okay, so construction is an area. I mean, our per capita um, cons- uh, constructed area in India is super low and can build. And therefore, associated industry, which are core industries, steel, cement, hmm. some of the manufacturing, I think they'll do very well. I think digital economy, I, we discussed in the beginning, uh, we are... We are not actually far behind most developed countries and mm. we have sort of great framework. I mean, and I think we can discuss it later, but, you know, between UPI and, and the jam that we have and reasonable population having bank account, mm. I think, you know, the digital infrastructure in India is sort of uh, relative to our developmental markers, you know, it's far ahead. Mm. But from an industry point of view, you know, I think that business will continue to do well. Our stature as a office uh, of the world or pharmacy of the world would perhaps really do well and grow in next 10, 15 years. Hmm. But okay, what we'll not do, I think most things will do well, as I said, core as well as the frontier stuff in India. Hmm. What we'll not do is that some of the industries which are going to get disrupted hmm. because of the new tech, okay, what are those industries? I think my own industry, let's say finance, will be disrupted quite dramatically. Hmm. Uh, and we can discuss about it. I think education, you know, with tele-education, uh, healthcare again, because if you see, um, you know, the locality uh, is not no more important for sort of giving advice, you know, as a doctor, you're sitting in Rajasthan, you can give advice to someone sitting in Delhi. Hmm. So that's quite a disruptive and you know, therefore it will disrupt sort of an existing uh, brick and mortar healthcare that the way we see them. Hmm. Energy, you know, which is, again, the carbon-based economy, the oil-based economy, all the ice vehicles, you know, which are plying on our roads today. Hmm. It's very likely. I mean, when we look at, say, we needed cold chain, supply chain logistics, uh, especially, you know. That will absolutely do phenomenal, of course, you know, that that will do very, very well. And some sort of a revolution is taking place in logistics in India. Hmm. Uh, So I think they'll do very well. But I... Energy? And what's energy, what's take on energy? energy is, is because the carbon-based and oil-based economy and energy-related business, related businesses in the energy, you know, I think would struggle because it will give into something that you said, right? You know, green tech. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, 
increasingly i would imagine that let's say by 2050 or 2040 or 2050 i would imagine that there'll be no ice vehicle on indian roads mm. uh, and by 2030s you know most europeans and chinese would be actually buying what you call evs so mm. to the extent the ice business the uh, co- internal combustion engine you know the diesel and petrol based you know two wheelers and four wheelers uh, would be passe you you've seen ola electric actually launching a uh, huge capacity in uh, in south you know which is going to supply uh, i i heard about 10 million vehicles every year uh, mm. two wheelers which are all uh, evs of sort so i think it's uh, that's a, i think the two wheeler business four wheeler business and pretty much the entire transportation business will will actually from um, pretty much 100% uh, gasoline based to you know electricity based you know so that transition will happen and i think we ought to be sort of be careful of the businesses which are going to struggle again your stuff like linear- what about the automobiles business itself as you mentioned right if there's going to be this this rapid evolution towards uh, you know mm-hmm. an ev side of business what about traditional automotive manufacturers i, I see struggle okay i see struggle uh, in automotive businesses uh, mm-hmm. in the way they are incumbents basically the the frontline ones you know who sell cars and two wheelers i think they will begin to struggle as uh, some of them will themselves will perhaps become good ev manufacturer mm. you know some of them will not be able to transform themselves you know so i i think we ought to be careful of you know some of the guys who are somewhat dismissive mm. and by the way you know ev is, is ev business is very different from ice business right and so in a sense it's not very clear to me that as of today let's say if i look at indian automotive players who would succeed is not preordained you know some of them not will- as linear as one might think it is yeah. that you know you can you can sort of evolve from a traditional uh, manufacturing base automotive manufacturing base to a sort of uh, you know ev uh, tesla kind of a company which itself you know as you mentioned see the problem i guess is the risk capital question right because how many are going to put up the money to evolve because that itself is a risk which which many people would be wondering whether they need to take or not the problem is you've got global competitors already doing it but taking into consideration the sectors you've mentioned which you see have high growth potential you mentioned home building you mentioned you know the ancillary steel cement manufacturing uh, and you know in terms of disruption as you mentioned you know you see finance education healthcare logistics all being disrupted and energy as well uh the the billion dollar question for anyone watching right now would be how can the indian investor take advantage of these sort of emerging opportunities emerging themes in the short and long term so what would you keep as the parameters to measure performance on on these themes which are emerging and also on the returns the right way what's your view on this manish so uh, uh, given that we didn't discuss you know this uh, the point you know after all our conversation that because of uh, something which hasn't changed in india and then mm. and certain reforms which have been undertaken mm. and these dramatic ones you know i wanted to emphasize and i made this point for last 10 11 months that i think stage is set for india to grow at 7 8% over like next 10 years you know this is beyond fi 22 which where we'll grow most probably at 13 14% but even after that 7 8% so it's a big deal mm. 7 8% real growth will mean uh 11 12% of nominal growth mm. typically uh such a strong economy is a, a reasonable condition for stock markets to do very well okay so broadly equities tend to do reasonably well in 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 setting such as this where you know economy is expanding as rapidly as sort of i valued hmm. uh so in that setting investor of course uh uh would know and recognize that there are inherent risks to uh allocating capital to equity because it tends to be more volatile it tends to have drawdowns all of a sudden for reasons that you as of today cannot surmise so therefore of course you know the risk allocation to equity versus fixed income versus real estate has to be sort of taken care of mm-hmm. and and there is no uh, big picture number that i can give to anyone everyone has to determine what is his risk appetite but okay the limited point i wanted to make is that if you want to participate in and if you believe in what i argued in last 15 20 minutes is that india can actually do well for the variety of reasons that we've we've discussed it's best to participate in that 
by investing in equity markets that's big picture now i mean anyone who has a stable money you know uh, in terms of uh, i mean i you know we are a young country so a lot of most of us actually are likely to see likely to see a sort of steady stream of you know income over next many years and decades and so to that extent i would imagine that we have a lot of patient money mm. stable, okay and that you know should look at earning 5 6 7% uh real return okay which basically on their portfolio which is which is inflation plus 5 6 7% so if inflation is going to be 5% then you know it it's fair at a portfolio level you target 11 12% return hmm. now how do you sort of benefit from this is the first thing first i think everyone must buy a house okay uh because real estate is relatively now after 5 6 years of bear market is cheap hmm. and interest rates are cheap too so so sort of buy a good house i think it will do it will take care of you vis-a-vis inflation and will earn somewhat better than fixed deposit or fixed income funds okay hmm. so let's say 3 4% real returns is what real estate can earn so but you can lever up there easily it's easy to uh uh sort of uh, it's a good collateral also so to that extent you know you can draw down as and when you require so that's the first thing hmm. and of course you know you have to have for your regular needs you know some sort of fixed income funds you know which will earn you about 1 2% real returns hmm. so if 5% is the inflation real returns so will mean 7% i'm talking of a longish horizon but then the term, people will always be worried about hearing about higher yields and <laughs> wondering about <laughs> that i'm talking of let's say your 10 year uh, you know psu bonds are earning you about 7% right now mm-hmm. if you buy it for 10 years you will earn 7% you know fair point the bots see lot of volatility and this is is in the mind of an investor who is actually a speculator mm. okay if you are a five year investor or 10 year investor there is no volatility if you are a 10 year investor in equity actually there is no volatility mm, mm. so so okay so these three, these two things out having bought a house and a small allocation to fixed income for your regular income need i think a very large part of your allocation should be bet on you should bet on equities you know through various funds that we can discuss so again you ask me there is to emerging opportunity now i'm fearful to actually talk of a specific opportunity in market because Hmm. Uh, i want people to be aware that you know these themes keep changing i think if you want to part- participate in this theme which has a lot of integrity to it that over next 10 20 years india will do very well i am very confident of that hmm. Hmm. and in that environment i am very confident that indian equities will do very well hmm. so it's best to allocate money in funds participating in you know in funds which invest in all sorts of things you know my Yeah, sort of a diversified fund some of it could be in small cap mid cap and so on and so forth that's a better approach for the audience that we are talking to of course we've discussed about you know what all can do well in india already so people mm. could have extract from it and say that okay those are the areas that i as a fund manager and money manager like mm. but i think for a broader audience i would say that the opportunity is for you to participate in india growth story by actually betting on indian markets Hmm. Uh, and i think the policy makers are also doing their best to make sure that you know funds are also giving e- importance for large cap mid cap small cap based on you know of course their due diligence that they do but it's not always a large cap story it's also the emerging stories but provided it's it's done with the right due diligence as you mentioned spread the spread the the money around and see which which growth story works out for you but in terms of the disruption as you mentioned that you that you see in finance itself the way to access the way to participate in the retail market has itself evolved substantially where it's where it's now available at the touch of a button that was not the case uh say you know 5 6 years earlier so do you see that theme helping you know a change habits of investors and also resulting in a substantial increase in retail participation for the india growth story on considering you know their resilient presence in the market uh, despite that pandemic is induced downturn as you mentioned as you mentioned you know people now have gotten into the habit of thinking long terms thinking about goals having their sips activated accordingly so do you see this now you know growing into a sort of snowball of sorts where 
retail participation uh, now becomes a very dominant force indian retail participation becomes a dominant force in the market i i i would totally agree with you gautam you know it first is part of a general evolution of every economy as economy and it's happened everywhere in the world that that eventually as the country gets rich uh, a very very substantial part of its population start to look for opportunities beyond what's routine okay and the routine of course is fixed deposits fixed income funds and and retail uh, sorry real estate hmm. so this equity culture you know is is it cannot be a top down you know that government telling people to invest it's it's, it's a bottom up one it you realize that you know you got enough saving and you have an experience of reasonable returns of the past many years and decades and therefore a lot of money begin to move to equity so hmm. so to that extent um i'm hopeful that india in somewhere somewhere between 2010 and 15 got to a point you know where we already had a little bit of a equity cult building you know let's get this right you know india has had an ecosystem of investing okay for very long but that's primarily you know ecosystem of hnis the super rich of the world but what we begun to see uh, gautam over last couple of years 5 6 years is you know even relatively middle middlers you know middle income people also starting to participate and mm. coming through sip you know which is again a great sort of an idea of investing slowly and steadily so that you can wrinkles in the market can you can get over them okay so i think you know we've we've begun to build that ecosystem it's regional some of the western states have a better ecosystem uh then northern ones and so on and so forth but i think it will spread hmm. in the end you know and not just cities it's tier 2 tier 3 towns tier 2 tier 3 city also you are starting to see that hmm. also we are also becoming a relatively more formal economy hmm. keep far too much cash okay is hurting uh financial repression is, is underway in any case bank deposits do not earn you much hmm. and won't earn you much not just in india but across the world so market oriented uh of products such as equity funds you know would gain more and more traction we already have a reasonable as i said um platform you know between pmss and mutual funds 15 16 lakh crore of equity funds are managed they've delivered a reasonable return i don't know about them you've been invested but they have, we've all collectively delivered somewhere between 13 to 15% over last 5 10 years so it's been a reasonable experience albeit with lot of volatility <laughs> so it's been there for it's the returns have been delivered for those who have stayed the course i guess you could you yeah, could but again also yeah. build the sort of uh, uh, an experience base for people for for them to look at and say well if you stay the course and if you are invested in the in the right way then there is a logic in staying on i guess as you mentioned earlier the equity cult used to be about direct equity investing right where it's like you're a day trader that's a different game altogether this is about disciplined investing investing in funds and investing in funds with a goal in mind which is yeah. what changes the game and when you see others kind of prospering with that approach you kind of start thinking that maybe this is something which i shouldn't do as something which is optional but something which is which is mandatory for my life to improve yes. so it's not again i mean just to stretch a bit okay that uh, older generation would an average older generation would actually think of equities as a lottery hmm uh, and which would which could make some people super rich but most people would always lose money was the was the general saying okay hmm. but but that's not true right equity is a legitimate asset class it has claims on the sort of cash flows after the debt of all the corporations so the all the great stuff being done by our promoters and enterprises you know if you want to benefit from it if you want to benefit from a larger india story if you have a reasonable amount of capital you can benefit mm-hmm. by investing in equity is a simple thought but it takes time it takes efforts and it takes a gum a country to grow to a certain point to actually begin to believe in it mm. i think you know it's i mean it's never right to say that our time has come but it looks like to me when i look around and you know speak to many people there is a reasonable force now 
Mm. Of people who believe in this idea that it's an asset class. It's not a speculative asset class. Mm. It's an asset class. If you stick around for long enough, there is the characteristic of asset class is such that it gives you some premium. Okay. Mm. Or, I mean, so if if fixed in, fixed deposits are likely to give you five percent over next ten years, it's very likely that on a random day, if you pick up equity as a basket, you will earn somewhere between five to. 10% of risk premium depending upon when you got in mm-hmm. if you got in at a bad time you perhaps will get only 4 5% if you get got in let's say just in the end of, uh, towards the end of march last year mm. you would perhaps make 10% excess absolutely. or absolutely absolutely i guess the discussion at least has become more sensible and as we were talking about the resilience of say domestic retail investors the question now is you know what's your view of global investment interest when it comes to india in this decade because now you have this counterbalancing force of domestic retail participation but what happens to global investment interest in the yeah, global in- I- I see they are more mature right because it's not because we we're not talking about one particular country but the global meaning oecd more specifically us and european they are more mature they've seen this playing out in country after country so they understand this and which is why you know they are coming in hordes mm. uh, both fii and fdi you know you will see india larger and larger part and percentage of indian enterprises ownership being transferred to the foreigners mm. and because they have the they have much more reason. first of all their economy is much bigger plus their saving pool is very large mm. plus on an average they are dramatically richer than us they also have an equity cult so therefore they are ready to dial this risk and they think that you know they are here for 20 30 years if i really sell so i think you know i imagine gautam over next 10 15 years every year you know a s- small percentage of indian ownership will be transferred to fiis hmm. they you are already seeing that okay i mean last one year i think fiis bought 1% of net outstanding stock okay so mm-hmm. i think you know they already own about 20 21% of india's uh, total market cap mm-hmm. this perhaps would go to 30% in next 10 20 years okay mm-hmm. so in a sense they are already very excited by the way this setting is also quite conducive for india and emerging market because of cheap capital low fed rate and so and so forth and markets across the world are expensive and the growth that india is promising to deliver and i'm not talking about the growth that i have argued okay which is 8% real and 4 5% uh, what do you call inflation so therefore 12% of nominal hmm. they will be super excited for even 9 10% of nominal growth considering so, the global context but the question the big question there is is fiscal deficit now then going to take a back seat for some time in this push for growth considering it's now at a i think it's it's at the highest level since liberalization in 91 and uh, if not then how do you expect india to bring it down from 9.5% of gdp in fy21 to 4.5% in fy26 without igniting inflation because right now the bigger worry is there's so much cheap money around the world everyone is wondering about inflation concerns and you know where that's going to lead us so what's your thought on this topic so gadam let's split it into two parts one is of course you know argument on fiscal orthodoxy and and 9.5% of course and even next year's fiscal deficit close to 7% did spook the market at least the bond market but you know it's a welcome change in my view uh, because this sort of fiscal orthodoxy that india has practiced especially after 2014 uh, even in the wake of uh, relatively constrained demand in india mm-hmm. and uh, our financials are under tremendous stress because of the past mistakes you know the leverage cycle has been unwinding in india for very long hmm. and in that setup you know it would have been the best thing to run relatively more fiscal deficit okay but we did not because of the fear of rating agencies and how external world will react to it but i think you know we've used this covid uh, as an opportunity to come clean on that and i think 9.5% of course fiscal deficit is a lot of show and tell the reality is that even in fy21 the actual fiscal deficit once you adjust for some transfers and kitchen sinking is more like 7.5% hmm. i think the good news uh, gotham is that uh, that you know we've given a framework that even in fy26 our fiscal deficit will be somewhere between 4 and 1/2 5% hmm. on an average for 5 years now 
we will run a fiscal deficit of about five and a half percent. Versus counterfactual, had COVID not happened, we would have run at three and a half percent. So, so basically, almost somewhere between one to two percent of excess fiscal spend is likely to play out over next mm-hmm. what do you call five years. If you re- if you convert this into lakhs of crores, you know it's almost like a, somewhere between twenty to thirty lakh crores of excess government spending. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now the big question uh, is the original question of us is that it's very easy to imagine that if our capacities are not there. all of this excess fiscal deficit would result in inflation mm. and that has been it's been an achilles heel for india for very long term you know every time india expands for a couple of years you know inflation comes about because remember in the beginning we discussed that india is extremely undercapacitated economy our growth's chief enemy has been or secular expansion's chief enemy has been inflation two three years of growth and inflation will return and therefore of course monetary policy and fiscal policies will have to uh, you know act accordingly and the expansion will get will get pricked hmm. so i think you know and which is why we go back to the reforms plis tax cuts and everything it seems to me hmm. it seems to me and this is a hypothesis that you know we our government understands this that while we run excessive fiscal deficit relative to counterfactuals it's important to build the capacities okay so how do you spend is an important thing if you spend by giving more to babus and government servants or you know cutting the consumption tax as we did in 2009 10 you'll get whole lot of inflation and very little long term growth but if you do the reverse that if you actually give lot of money uh through plis to build manufacturing in india mm. you spend a lot of this money in actually improving border infrastructure urban infrastructure have metros in place and so on and so forth inflation won't return okay so okay now this is the second part that inflation will return because of excess fiscal deficit is not a given thing mm. but it is given that if it is miss spent on revenue items instead of capital item okay mm. it will trigger a lot of inflation okay and again just to give you a context that you know when rest of the world last one year because of the covid shock was actually experiencing low or negative core inflation india even in last one year experienced very high inflation about 5% core inflation hmm. and that happens again and again because you know again our original point that our capital stock is so low that a small shock and you get an inflation but the solution to that is not a typical central banking macro top down solution that cut the aggregate demand hmm. the solution is to build capacities you know become, i think that's the key here because as you mentioned you build, build resilience by of- making sure that the capacity exists uh, to to withstand that and whether that's the case of the government or the average investor it matters what you do with the money uh, i'm sure we can keep discussing this for a, for a whole another hour but uh, we we've, al- we've almost run out of time uh so a last summary statement uh, maybe for 20 seconds uh, your message to the indian investor about the india growth story what would that be yeah so i mean in in, in a line or two you know in 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 the evolution of india uh, since independence we have come to a point where it seems that there is enough fuel in our economy to to sort of help it take off uh i don't understand i i don't i mean these are political narrative of 5 trillion dollar 10 trillion dollar but i'm very confident that if you stick around for 20 30 40 years you know india will become 40 50 trillion dollar economy hmm. in 2050 in our estimate is 50 trillion and if you want to sort of ride that india growth it's happening right in front of you i think you know the way to participate is in invest in um equity funds regularly hmm. in, in by way of sips diversify your portfolios uh, of course you know do buy a home and put some money in fixed income to ensure that you know you have a reasonable shelter as well as regular income don't exit in panic because covid or lehman or something or other would keep playing out every 3 5 year so do, but investors have become somewhat more mature mm-hmm. they right now they're exiting because they made a lot of money in last 5 7 years but generally i think this trend would reverse but i my hope is that we are able to convince few 100000 investors today 
Gautam, so that you know they come back <laughs> and invest and participate in this. Absolutely, story. absolutely. On, uh, I guess you know you have to grow with the India growth story. That's uh, that's the message there. But you have to stay invested. On that optimistic note, uh, let's wrap up this exchange of thoughts and insights on the race towards economic glory for India and what it means for the Indian investor. And as they say, if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far. run together thank you manish for joining us in this conversation a uh, pleasure speaking with you and of course thank you to our viewers for tuning in have a great day mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully